you can still do better than that hallelujah he is worthy he is worthy he is worthy to be praised he is the lord god almighty the one who was who is who is to come may you bless the lord this morning he is worthy to be praised you can do better than that because he woke you up this morning he is worthy to be praised the lord who woke you up this morning and gave you a breath of life you can praise him better than that the lord who protects you and guides you you can do better than that to the lord who stands forever and ever you can do better than that to the one who rose Jesus from the dead and assures us of our own salvation and resurrection you can do better than that hallelujah 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 Jesus we need to know when we worship him who we worship him you can't clap your hands like you are clapping for Pilani. For the last time, praise the Lord. Yes. I promise you if we don't stop stop now they're not going to be preaching there's so much of God's presence in this place let's sit let's be seated amen greetings in the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ amen, amen. are we excited to be in the house of the Lord yes. are you excited to be in the house of the Lord yes. amen just greet your neighbor and welcome him or her in the house of the Lord. I just want to take this time to thank God for this wonderful opportunity that I have this morning to minister the word of the Lord. Amen. And I was praying and I was saying to the Lord, it's amazing how, Lord, you've got a history of using imperfect people. Amen. Amen. If any one of us were to come here and preach uh, from a place of perfection, none of us will qualify. Amen. So that's why you'll hear me when I preach. I usually will not say you, but I include myself in that because I'm no better. But God is just use, is speaking to me as he speaks to you as well. Amen. Hallelujah. So I thought I should just say that in the beginning, but also I just want to say thank you so much to mom and dad for entrusting us with such a huge responsibility and just for being there for all of us as our parents and praying for us and making sure that they bring us in the ways of the Lord. Would you just clap your, your hands and, and thank him. Amen. <clears throat> and if you are here for the very first time, I'm not the pastor of this church. Our bishop is, is not around. Please come back when he's here. <laughs> You will see how amazing it is, but it's still going to be amazing today, but just come back when the anointing is higher. Amen. But please just feel welcome. Uh, we, we really appreciate to have you. We'll appreciate you and welcome you officially at the end of, 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 of the service. But quickly, I just want to do a, a flashback to what um, God has been saying to us the past couple of Sundays. Amen. Uh, I was telling the saints in the morning that I, I, I apologize in the beginning that maybe I might disappoint you because I won't come with anything new, but I'll just be building upon what we are already uh, learning as a church. Amen. 
and it helps that way that we grow together. We don't get new things every Sunday, but we are able to see how everything connects with each other. So just going back to the 25th celebration, how many people were here? Were you here? You will remember that uh, Bishop Sono and Bishop Bobby Hill were here and they spoke and taught us about building a lasting legacy. Do you still remember that? So I just want to, I want to take you from, from that. And then after that, our lovely bishop did a wonderful job by just helping us make sense of what God was saying to us. Amen. And then he identified seven elements of a God-honoring, people-empowering legacy. And this is what he labeled as the seven needs. Do you still remember that, Basalwan? <laughs> Do you still remember? So if I was to point at you at random, will you give me the seven needs? No, not really. Okay. So this is what, so I ask you to just go back to these things. Like I said that I'm repeating the stuff that has been said, <laughs> but it feels like it's new already because you don't, you don't seem to be remembering. So this is what the bishop uh, called the seven needs. So I won't go through them because of our time. Uh, but after that, the Sundays that came, after that, the three Sundays, firstly, the bishop spoke to us about the eff effective Christian work. Amen. And then the Sunday, building from that, he then taught us about the mature Christian work. I'm sure you still remember that. And he also spoke about usefulness and being useful and, and, and all of that. Amen. And then last Sunday, uh, which you should still remember because it's just uh, last Sunday, he then spoke to us about the anointed Christian work. Amen. Now, taking from that, this morning, we will talk about building character to protect the legacy. Amen. Now, this is a wonderful picture because it just summarizes nicely for us what we are doing and what God has been talking to us about. So, including today, uh, where God is talking to us about building character to protect the legacy. Amen. Uh, as I said, that last Sunday, Bishop talking about um, the anointed Christian work, there is something very profound which he said, which I want to begin with. He said that, a Christian walk, and I quote, he said, a Christian walk must be anointed to be effective. You still remember that? He said, a Christian walk must be anointed to be effective. But now I want to add to that truth, like I promised you that I'm building from that. I want to add to that and say, even though a Christian walk must be anointed to be effective, the anointing can never protect your character. It is your character that will protect your anointing. In other words, saints, character will protect your anointing, but your anointing will not protect your character. One of the greatest mistakes we can ever make is to ask God to give us the anointing before we ask him to make us or to shape us. Are you with me, someone? A great mistake that the prodigal son made was to go to his father and first say, Father, give me. And when he came back later, only then he said, Father, make me. I was alone. The prodigal son started with what he should have ended with and ended with what he should have started with. He said, Father, give me. Only later on, he said, Father, make me. It is very dangerous to be given before you are made. If you are given before you are made, you will make a big mess of that which you are given. Can I repeat that for someone? If you are given before you are made, you will make a big mess of that which you are given. A big mess. In Africans, they call it a cruel chemos. <laughs> Last year, I registered for an African's course. I finished it. At the end of the year, I got the certificate, but not the Africans. <laughs> I don't know what went wrong. So you will be, make a big mess of that which you are given if you are given before you are made. 
God spent 40 years with the children of Israel trying to make them. He could have given them the inheritance quicker than he did. But it ended up delaying because he was still trying to make them. He could not give them <laughs> before he could make them. Many of the things that are delaying in our lives, it's because God is still trying to make us. We are busy saying, Lord, give me. But God says, I want to make you. Hey, Basalwan. Hey, Kosiam. Nyangiso Basalwan. God build a character in us, is what we are saying today. We are saying, God, make us. God, mold us. God build a character in us that will protect the legacy of our fathers. That's all we are saying this morning. If you read the book of Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, this is what the word says in the NIV. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the porter. We are all the work of your hand. Amen. Amen. Now, this phrase that we find in this verse, in the Hebrew, it says yatza. That phrase, you are the porter, is the word yatza. Yatza means to mold into form. It means to give shape. And it also means to influence the formation or development of something. Did you get that? I grew up in the rural areas. And in the rural areas, we used to play in the river and we would play with clay. And we would take clay with my friends and we would just try to, to make some shapes. So I would take it. I was not good at it. In fact, I was bad at it. And I would try and make a cow. And the cow will look so ugly. And I would change it and make a cat. And the cat will, make so, uh, will look so ugly. And I would just make a table because the table was easier to make. You know, you just make it flat, and then you just make those legs, boom, it's done. <laughs> you know, during that process, the clay will not complain. I will just mold it until I got the shape that I wanted. You see, I was molding it. I was influencing the formation and the development of the shape. God wants to give us shape. God wants to influence the formation and the development of our character. I am saying God wants to mold us. He wants to shape us. He wants to develop the character in us. A character that is capable of sustaining or protecting the legacy of our fathers. So God is saying, I want to make you. And this morning, we want to come before God and say, yes, Lord, we have spoken to us about the legacy, but we are availing ourselves. We are saying, Lord, make us. Because if God can make us, God can give us. So the question that we are answering this morning is, what are the character traits required to protect the legacy? Did you get that? What are the character traits required to protect the legacy? I will read for us from 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1 to 14. I will read from the NIV translation, and I will skip some of the verses. But I ask you when you get home, please just read the whole chapter. Amen. I will start from verse 1, and it says, After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. With 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of Libyans, Sukites, and Cushites that came with him from Egypt, he captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak. And he said to them, this is what the Lord says. 
You have abandoned me, and therefore I now abandoned you. When she shall king of Egypt, I'm skipping to verse 9. When she shall king of Egypt attack Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned this to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with him, bearing the shields, and afterward they returned them to the guard room. I'll skip to verse 13. King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. His mother's name was Nama. She was an Ammonite. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. Amen. Now, just a very quick background to this portion of scripture that we just read. Earlier on, God appeared. Are you with me, Basalwan? God appeared to David, and he said to him, you will not build a temple for me, because your hands are filled with blood. So it was his son Solomon who built the temple. So earlier on in the, in the chapters we see uh, Solomon building the temple and dedicating it to the Lord. Amen. Now in chapter 9, which is a few chapters from where we read today, um, what happens there is that Solomon died, right? But before he died, the Bible tells us that he made 200 shields of gold. Now, these 200 shields of gold were for public viewing. So people could see them, and every time they saw these shields of gold, they remembered that the glory of the Lord was upon them. So these 200 shields of gold were representative of the glory of the Lord among his people. But when Solomon died, Rehoboam took over after him. Now, the Bible says in chapter 11, Initially, he walks in the ways of his fathers until his kingdom was established. This is where we get the portion of scripture that we read. Now, we started from verse 1, and the Bible said, after Rehoboam's position as king was established and yet become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the ways of the Lord. So when he became successful, that is when he abandoned the Lord. So does success destroy character? Not really. It is not because success destroys character. Success just exposes who you really are. Some people you may think they are very humble. But not that they are humble, it's just that they are poor. Someone knows that after church they must get a lift from you. But God blesses them with a car. Then you see them being nasty. You say, what happened? Does success change character? No. Success just exposed who the person really was. So this is what we see with Rehoboam. Rehoboam had the responsibility to protect the legacy of his father's. But what does the Bible say? It says he abandoned the law of the Lord and he became unfaithful to God. So what is the first character trait that is required to protect the legacy? Number one, it is faithfulness to the Lord. Are you with me this morning? From verse 1 to verse 5, we see this. It is faithfulness to the Lord. Now, Bishop Charlo differentiates between being faithful and being faithful. And he says being faithful is the question of how much you can trust God. But being faithful is the question of how much God can trust you. In other words, it's a question of how trustworthy you are. So that's what we are talking about when we talk about faithfulness to the Lord. So because of Rehoboam's unfaithfulness, the Bible shows us 
that the enemy found his way to Jerusalem. His unfaithfulness exposed the house of Jerusalem and made them vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Are you with me, Basalwan? So the enemy is after our peace. The enemy is after our joy. The enemy is after our finances. The enemy is after our testimony. But he can't get through it because of our faithfulness. Faithfulness to God is our fortification. In other words, it prevents the enemy from robbing us. Our lives, Basalwane, are fortified because of our faithfulness to God. But did you see what happened in verse 4? The Bible shows us in verse 4 that even this, the fortified cities of Judah were captured. In South Africa, this word capture is very famous. <laughs> because of, of some people who became unfaithful, the country got captured. We will not go that route. <laughs> so this means that unfaithfulness destroys our fortification. It, it creates a pathway for the enemy to have access to our lives because of being unfaithful. Whatever our fathers hand over to us will never be, be safe if we fail to be faithful to God. Did you get that? Did you get that? Whatever our fathers hand over to us will never be safe if we do not learn to be faithful to God. So the first a character trait needed is faithfulness to God. But you can never be faithful in any relationship without being set apart. So faithfulness to God begins with being set apart. And being set apart refers to holiness as we have been taught in this church. Amen. Ephesians 5 verse 27 shows us that Jesus is returning for a holy bride. Hey, Basalwan. Ephesians 5 does not talk about an organized bride. Doesn't talk about an organized church. But being organized is good though. It doesn't talk about a relevant church. But being relevant is good. It doesn't talk about all the other things which are good. But what Jesus is really returning for is a holy bride. Are you with me? So holiness is the predominant quality for the bride of Christ. He is coming back for the holy church. I'm going to say this until you say amen. Jesus is returning for a holy church. Amen. Jesus is returning for a holy church. Amen. amen. So to protect the legacy, we need faithfulness to the Lord. Amen. Amen. We need to be faithful to the Lord. The second thing, what are the character traits needed to protect the legacy? Number two, being legacy-minded. Amen. Being legacy-minded. This we see in verse 10. Now when I say being legacy-minded, this refers to understanding the true value of legacy. Do you get me, Basalwan? When I say being legacy-minded, I mean understanding the true value of legacy. Now what we see in verse 10 is that Rehoboam replaced the gold shields with bronze. His father built with gold, but he replaced gold with bronze. Bronze does look similar to gold, but they are not the same things. Bronze and gold are two different things. They may look almost similar, but they are two different things. Bronze is an alloy. It is a combination of copper and other materials, which means it is not pure. Bronze turns dark brown in the presence of an acid. Bronze is less dense. Bronze is cheaper. Bronze tarnishes. Bronze is not gold. So why was Rehoboam okay with replacing gold with bronze? Where our fathers have built with gold, 
Will we come and replace the gold with bronze? Why should we be okay with the enemy coming and attacking and stealing gold? Rehoboam was relaxed and he even went further and he replaced it with bronze. He did not attack back and protect the legacy. He was not legacy minded. He did not attach the correct value to the legacy. Do you see where I'm going with this? He did not attach the correct value. He was not legacy minded. Proverbs 22 verse 28 say in the World English Bible, don't move the ancient boundary stone which your fathers have set up. Hey, Basalwan. There are boundary stones set by our fathers which should never be moved. Such as the stone of prayer. Such as the stone of holiness. Such as the stone of generosity. Such as the stone of sound doctrine. In case you didn't notice, I'm on the sermon of the seven needs. You remember? Point number five of the sermon, the bishop talked about the tenants. He called it the tenants. It's the same thing. I package it differently. <laughs> but are you following it? Bishop said the need to remain true to the tenants of our Christian faith. And today, I'm saying these are boundary stones that should never, ever be moved. We can improve and do other things, but there are stones, ancient boundary stones, that should never, ever be moved. But this guy, Rehoboam, he, he, he failed to attach the correct value to the legacy. Reminds me of another story of, of, of Jabu. Jabu was raised by a single mom. So she raised him up so nice and he graduated from varsity and went his way to prosper. Are you with me? But now as he was prospering, he said, I want to do something special for my mom. Something that is unique. Okay, so he wasn't sure what, so he thought about it for a long time until an idea, a good idea came. He remembered that his mom loved reading the Bible but she couldn't anymore because she was old. So she said to, he said to himself, I will find a parrot, I will buy a parrot and get elders in church to train it to memorize scriptures. So it took, uh, imagine Elder Harper, Elder God's Power and, <laughs> and Pastor Henry sitting for several years training this. A lot of work went into this. So the elders in church trained this parrot for some time until it memorized from Genesis to Revelations. I had the parrot somewhere there. Where's my parrot, guys? There is the parrot. So all it took for the mother was just to say John 3 verse 16. And the parrot will say what John 3 verse 16 says. So then he sent this parrot to his mom. And then afterwards, the mother sent a letter of thanks. And the mother wrote to Jabu and said, Jabu, the little chicken you sent was delicious. <laughs> Meaning she ate it. You see, the parrot was a great resource. But the mother failed to attach the correct value to the parrot. Therefore, she killed and ate it. And I'm saying to us this morning, there is danger when we fail to attach the correct value to the legacy. I don't know if someone is hearing me this morning. Rehoboam failed to attack the correct value. Therefore, he failed to defend and protect the legacy of his fathers. And he substituted it with bronze. Hey, Kosiam. Something very sad happens in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. If you read that chapter, we will not read there. Something very strange happens there. The chapters earlier on, before that, we see the sin of Ahab. 
Now, because of that sin, in the book of Kings, we see that they were attacked by the famine. Now, this is what the Bible says in verse 25 of that chapter. It says that the famine was so bad that they started selling and eating donkeys' heads. There was dirty, and the head was the worst part of it. But it gets even worse. The Bible continues to say they ate and they sold for five shekels the dove's dung. Do you know what the dove's dung is? Must I go into detail? Okay. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. I don't know if you have thought of it this way. Listen, Masalwan. The fact that they ate the dove's dung, the fact that the dung was there, means that there was once a dove. Every time they picked the dung, they remembered that there was once a dove. They were feasting on dove's dung because the dove was gone. Reminds me of Luke chapter 3. The Bible says when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit fell on him like a dove. And it is my prayer this morning that when our fathers go, the dove may not live with them. There are churches today who are already feasting on the dove's dung because the dove is gone. Great churches that started well. I will not mention names. But today, they are feasting on the dove's dung. Why? Because the dove is gone. We are not different. It can happen to us. That when our fathers leave, that when our fathers go, they go with the dove because of our character. And we are left feasting on the dove's dung. It is my prayer this morning that when our fathers go, they may not live with the dove. That the dove may not live. Is someone hearing me from the Spirit this morning? Hallelujah. When we substitute the gold with bronze, the dove will live. Let us be legacy minded and protect the gold shields. Let us be legacy minded and make sure that we do not move the boundary stones of old. What are the character traits needed to protect the legacy? Point number three, honoring the Lord more than the people. Honoring the Lord more than the people. This we see from verse 10 to verse 11, where the Bible said, So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned this to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Verse 11 says, whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with him, bearing the shields, and afterward they returned them to the guard room. Did you see that? After the Hoboam substituted the shields of gold with bronze, what he did was he locked them up and made sure that they were secure. Remember what I said earlier on, these were representative of the glory of God. So every time the people will see that they are gone, they will remember that the glory of the Lord is no longer here. So he cared more, Ish, Masalwan, I wish you could hear this. Rehoboam cared more about what people thought than what God really thought. The gold of sheaths were gone, but all what he cared about was for people not to look at the bronze and realize that something is different. I have a better example for you. The example of Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, please read it when you get home. You know what happens there? God rejected Saul. And when you read verse 30, you see there, when the, the prophet Samuel was breaking the news that God has rejected you, you know what he says? He says, please still come with me and worship with me so that the people may get the impression that God is still with me. 
So Saul cared more about what people thought than about God rejecting him. It's like he's saying, I hear that. It's fine that God has rejected me. But come, let's give an impression to people that God is still there. If people are okay, I'm okay. If people, what people think of me is okay, I'm okay. You know why? He cared more about his reputation than his character. Character is what God thinks of you, but reputation is what people think of you. Many of us are working on our reputation, but not our, oh God. These are the days where we're starting to honor men more than we honor God. You remember Bishop Tutu, what Bishop Tutu said? He said, I will not worship a God who is homophobic. And he started saying things like that. And you know what happened? The media and the newspapers, they labeled him as the moral conscience of the nation. So they were celebrating him, saying this is a good man. He's a different man. You know why? Because he was saying what people like to hear. And I was telling Abbas around this morning that as I was praying, I think it was three weeks ago, then the Holy Spirit started telling me that we have entered a time where, where the people who will get higher platform in society, people who will be asked during the national celebrations, maybe an, an NC conference or whatever, people who will stand there and pray are people who are loved by people, are people who say things that resonate with people, are people who are politically correct. So we have a choice to choose, we have a choice to make as this generation. Are we choosing to honor men? Are we choosing to please men? Because it's going to be very tempting. You will get the best platforms because what you are saying is good. Because what you are saying is politically correct. Because what you are saying is nursing the, the, the feelings of the society. So we have to make a decision now. Will we honor God or we will we honor man? But this is the problem that we see with Saul. He was more concerned with what people thought of him, not what the Lord thought of him. Remember the story, I'm sure some of you have heard it, the story of the boy who was playing a piano. And this boy played the piano so well and the people in the auditorium were applauding him. They were standing, they gave him a standing ovation and they, were, and they were clapping for him, celebrating him. But the boy was not okay. He sat there and he kept quiet. And the man next to him said, but why are you not happy? Can't you see that everyone, all the people are celebrating you? He said, no. Do you see that one man sitting up there in the auditorium? He is sitting down and he's not applauding. And then this man said, but why do you care? With one old man, he's probably deaf. He didn't hear how good you were. And the young boy said, no, you don't understand. That man is the author of this song. And the same man is the one who was my teacher. So the fact that he's not applauding means that I didn't do it right. Now the question this morning is, whose song are we playing? <laughs> whose song are we playing? Are we impressing the teacher, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete himself, or are we impressing men? The boy said, as long as the teacher is not happy, everyone can sit down here. But if he stands up and applauds, I've done my job. But with us, it has become the opposite, the exact opposite of that. We don't care what God thinks. As long as people think we are okay, it's okay. As long as people applaud us, we are okay. But is God applauding you? When I finish preaching this sermon, as you are applauding now, will God be standing in heaven and applauding? Is the question I should ask myself. 
As you sing a nice song here and we compliment you and say you sang well, is God in heaven saying you sang well, my daughter, or God is saying rottenness, rottenness, rottenness. While you are busy raising your hands, saying holiness, holiness, God is saying rottenness. And we will stand and we'll applaud you, saying that girl sang so well this morning. It was so good. But God said, hey, I miss worship. And God said, I just miss worship. I just wish someone can give me worship. Because you see, great voices are actually good. I'm in support of that because I don't have that. So, I mean, I, I really... <laughs> I love, I love people with great voices and I believe that God loves them too, but God looks beyond the voice. And God looks at the heart. A heart is what worships God, not the voice. Oh my God. What are the character traits needed to protect the legacy? Number one, I said faithfulness to the Lord. Number two, I said being legacy-minded. Number three, I said honoring the Lord more than the people. Number four, which is number last, a heart set on seeking God. A heart set on seeking God. This is what we see in verse 14. You remember verse 14? Verse 14 said, he did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. So if your heart is not set on seeking the Lord, it will be set on seeking other things. A life of sin is usually as a result of a heart that is not set on the Lord. Are you with me, Basalwan? It is very easy to be a minister in the house of the Lord without being a minister to the Lord. You didn't hear that. We need to be ministers to God first before we are ministers of God. Can I say that again for someone here? We need to minister to him more than we minister for him. As you come and usher in this house, that is ministering for God. But are you ministering to him in your closet? When you are sitting down there praying and seeing the Lord and coming to church with the power of the Holy Ghost and stand by a door and a man who is coming from deep in the ocean coming to spread the spirit of fornication as you grab his head in the door, he falls down. Because you are not just an usher in the church. We need to deal with that mentality that I'm just an, an usher in the church. Only Bo Angela and them who sing in front. Not all of us. As you stand an usher at the door, as you welcome him, and the power of God just gets hold of him, and it throws him down, and the demon comes out. By the time Baba Ome comes, you tell him you are late, Baba. You know why? Because you are a minister to God before you are a minister for God. It is very easy for the enemy to take you down if you are busier with the labor of God than you are with the God of the labor. Yes. Serving in the house of the Lord is good. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Serving in the house of the Lord is, in fact, you should feel bad if you just sit and don't do anything. We need more people in the cleaning team, more people in that team, and more people in that team. So you cannot sit. You have to serve. But when service becomes more important than the relationship with God, there is a problem. That's all I'm trying to say. Amen. You know, when, 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 when David came and saw Goliath, the enemy, 
busy inciting God, Pastor. And they were said, busy inciting God and the people of God. And they were all scared. And, and, and he found it strange. And he was honest. It really confused him. It really did. He's like, but why are they scared? Why are they allowing him to insult God this way? And Saul exaggerated the power. And listen to that. Saul exaggerated the power of the enemy. He says, no, this one has been, has been fighting since he was young. But you know what? There is, there is something that happened in privacy. Where the king was, where the king was not there. Where the newspapers was not there. Where the media was not there. When he was alone in private. He saw a bear coming. He tore it apart. He saw a lion coming. He tore it apart. In his mind, he's combining a lion and a bear. They are more powerful than Goliath. Then he asked, who is this Goliath? (laughs) He was really confused. Why are they shaking? You see, there are times when we are shaking about issues and someone else is saying, why? Because there is something they know about God which you don't know yet. That is why they are not easily moved. That is why they are not easily shaken. That is the nature of the people who own a private space. That was the issue with David. David. Because he had a private space. There are things. So now he was taking, hey, Basaran, he was taking from what he saw God doing in, what have you seen God doing in private? He was taking now from what he had seen God doing in private. He got celebrated for, for, for what he practiced in private. He got celebrated in public for what he practiced in private. Are you with me, Bazaran? What do you do in your private space when no one sees you? Bazaran, 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 Bazaran. Bazaran means saints. By the way, someone asked me, what does that thing mean that you always say? It means saints. We cannot get by just by the prayers that we make in church. Because when we make prayers in church, it's like washing hands. You know when you, clean, when, you, when you clean yourself washing hands before you eat? That is cleaning yourself, right? But your body or your hands, only your hands are exposed to the water. So you wash your hands. But when you go to the shower, that is also still cleaning yourself. But the difference now is that in the shower... You are fully exposed to the water. You take off everything. You actually close the door. It's your private space. And your body is exposed. And the water is getting every part of your body. You cannot get by only by washing hands. As I said in the morning, some people think they can get by just by washing hands. That's why they... You know the rest of the word, right? You will stink. You need time where you go in a private space and you say, I am showering now. Every part of my body is exposed to the water. Bazalwan, there are prayers that you cannot make here. Because here we come to wash hands. So there are prayers. You know, I was saying in the morning, I sit just before, behind the bishop and mama bishop. There are prayers that if I start making they will keep quiet and say, this boy is never preaching again in this church. <laughs> so I wash my hands. But when I get to my private space, I have to be exposed and say, Lord, deal with this. Deal with this. Deal with this. Do you ever go into the shower? <laughs> Looks like what happened to us in the morning service is happening now. We're going to have to skip some things here. You know, I did a, a two-week course this past two weeks that we're coming from <clears throat> until Thursday, Friday. And the, the building where we're attending this course had four floors. So the first floor, there are people who are attending there, 
but it was also a floor where we were, we were having uh, refreshments and we socialized, and all of us had access to that place. But as you go up to the fourth floor where, I, where my class was, fewer people got there. But one thing I noticed is that on the first floor, the bathrooms were dirty. The ladies tried cleaning them, but because we kept on going, they were dirty. But on the fourth floor, since there were fewer people, the toilets were clean. So that's where I kept on going. <laughs> but something else I noticed there is that there were nice offices where there is, you can see opportunities, you can talk to people there, they tell you about overseas opportunities. There was a globe of, of the world and everything that was nice, I experienced there. But now when we're filling the forms, uh, talking about our experiences, there are people who had only been to the first floor. <laughs> All that they spoke about were dirty toilets. But I was speaking about clean toilets. I was talking about opportunities to go overseas. And they are saying, what are you talking about? But we're in the same building. You know why? Because I went to the fourth floor and they remained in the first floor. There are people in this building. They come to the same building with us, but they remain on the first floor. That is why they give us problems. They say, what are you talking about? Because we've been to the fourth floor and we confuse them. Are you prepared to push to the fourth floor? Are you prepared to push to the fourth floor? This is what God is saying to, God, to us. He says, seek me. Have a heart that is set on seeking me. Push, push to the fourth floor. You will see other dimensions that no one else saw because you cared to push to the fourth floor. I still wanted to talk about Jesus sending the crowds away, but he was called to minister to crowds, but he was sending crowds away. There's a contradiction there that I wanted to explain and get into. It's exciting, but because of time, I want to. I want, but all the young people on the 27th, who will get into this? On the 27th, will get into this. Can I hear the young people on the 27th? If you are older than 30, please don't come. But everyone to the age of 30, please come. Because this is wonderful. Amen. I still wanted to, to teach you about preservation. Because what happens in the book of Exodus... We see manna melting when it's kept overnight. And also if it's exposed to the sun, we see it melting. But God says, keep it for generations to come. I want us to get to that. We'll leave that one for camp. We'll leave that one for camp. Hallelujah. But I want to talk about fresh milk before I close. You know, in our house we buy fresh milk in, fresh milk in, in cartons. You know, these cartons, and it's written fresh milk. So I open it, and I, I do my coffee, because I was working from home, and I keep it in the fridge. And then the next days, I had to go to work all the days until I had to work home again. And then I open the fridge. The carton is sitting there. It's written fresh milk. <laughs> and I open the carton. The milk is rotten. The milk is only fresh by label. Some of us are just Christians by labels. It's written Christian, but it's rotten. Fresh milk, but it's rotten milk. Let me leave all these things and conclude because our time is gone. I want us to pray now. Let me conclude with a story of a young man. Can I please have a tissue? of a young man. Now this young man climbed the podium. Thank you so much, Papa. This young man climbed the podium and he recited Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and, and he went on, you know how it continues to go. But this young man was so articulate, he was so precise, he knew when to raise his voice and when to lower it, he was just so good. Such that when he finished reciting the psalm, everyone was standing, clapping their hands. 
And once he was done, an old man stood up. And he also went to the podium. And he, reti- he recited the same psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. But his voice was not so good. He was not so eloquent. He was not so articulate. He didn't know where to raise his voice and to lower it. But he carried on until he finished the psalm. But when he got to the end of the psalm, this time around people were not clapping, but people were on their knees. Some were crying. Some were repenting. Some were praying. It was a mess in the house. After the service, the young man went to the old man. He said, I was more eloquent than you were. I recited it so perfect. But how come when you did it, everyone went on their knees? The old man looked at the young man. He said, the difference between me and you is that you know the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, but I know the shepherd. You see, the danger that we are facing as this generation is for us to become so eloquent, so articulate, that we know the homiletics, the hermeneutics, the exegesis, and everything else. We know the psalm, but not the shepherd. We know how to, to, to preach the voice, to preach a proper sermon, to serve and to do everything. But the question is, now that you know the psalm, do you know the shepherd? Do you know the shepherd? And God is saying to us this morning as we pray that I want you to know both the psalm, but more so the shepherd. Yes, be articulate. Yes, know how to do these things and do them well, but know the shepherd. I want you to know the shepherd. And this is what God is calling us into, saying, my people seek my face, spend time in my presence, have your closet where you pray and seek my face. If you do so, you will protect the legacy of your fathers. I want us to stand on our feet. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit has laid in your heart, but I want us just to start praying. Just pray to the Lord right now. Just raise your your voice unto the Lord and begin to pray. Father, we come before you this morning, ancient of days. Can I hear you praying? Father, we thank you this morning, almighty God, for speaking to us the way you have, almighty God. Father, may we be a generation that will not only know the psalm, but let us know the shepherd of God. Let us have a, a relationship with the shepherd of God. Let us not be a generation that will be articulate of God, but that will not have a relationship with God. May you help us, almighty God, to be a generation that will not remove the ancient boundary stones. May you help us, O God, that we may be a generation that will protect the gold shields. Help us, O Jesus. Help us, O Jesus. Reba sata mandala sioko mondo lo siaka. Reka sata mandala sieke mandala sika. In the name of Jesus. While we are praying, while we are praying, as we'll continue praying for five more minutes, we'll continue praying. But if you are in this place, as we talk about the shepherd, maybe you are here, you are saying, My brother, I have not made the first decision 
which is to come into contact with the shepherd. Maybe you are here in this house listening to the sound of my voice and you are saying, my brother, I have not made Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. I want to tell you this morning that the shepherd himself is here. The shepherd is ready to welcome you in his arms. If you are saying, my brother, I want this opportunity so that you may pray for me and help me to accept Jesus as the Lord and the Savior of my life. If you are here, just shoot that hand up so that I can see you and pray with you. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the ushers will help me to look around. If you are here, just raise that hand. I want to see that hand and I will pray with you. If you want Jesus in your life, it would be a great mistake to close this service without extending this opportunity to you. I'll just give you an extra minute. If you are here, I will pray with you. Just raise that hand. If I see that hand, I will pray with you. If you say, my brother, I want this Jesus. If you are saying, my brother, I want this shepherd. Just raise that hand and I will pray with you. If there's no one you will want to, please just come, I'll pray with you. If you want to come, come. If you're not coming, it's also fine. But if you want to, please come. We'll just be patient. If there's anyone in this house, we'll pray with you. Please just clap hands for her. Is there anyone who wants to be as bold as my sister here? No, you can just stand there. Yeah. Does she understand English? What language does she understand? French. French. Can someone help me lead? Can you please just lead her in, in, in French? Because I wanted to make this prayer uh, understanding uh, what she is doing. Amen. So I will just lead you uh, 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 in the Lord. Amen. So please just lead her. Oh, you want to read a go? Okay. Okay. He's going to take you. Please just clap hands as they go. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's just be seated for a minute. One of the things that God has spoken to us about this morning is the issue of faithfulness. Amen. And he's saying to us, I want you to be faithful because you have, if you are faithful, you'll be able to protect the legacy. Amen. So while we are still on that note, I want us to respond to the Lord, Barcelona. And say, Lord, you're speaking to us about faithfulness. We just want to be faithful to you in the area of tithes and offering. Because God has spoken to us in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10. He says, bring the tithes and the offering. Not tithes or offering, but tithes and offering. Amen. So if you are here and you just need an envelope for tithes, please just raise that hand so that the ashes can see you. And they will assist you with an envelope. If you want to say, Lord, you have spoken to me about faithfulness and I want to be faithful to you. Just raise that hand and grab an envelope and we'll pay your tithe. Amen. Uh, that's the money that belongs to the Lord and it's the first 10% of your income. But also, as you came with your offering as well, I'd like you to have it in your hand. This is a free will offering. Offering. This is us coming to God and just saying, Lord, thank you for all that you have done in my life. Amen. It's a free will offering. No one specifies how much it is. You just decide and say, God has been this much good to me. Therefore, I will give him this much. Is that okay? So if you are here and you have your offering in your, can you please just have it in your hand? And if you have your tithe, I'll humbly request that you stand on your feet so that we may pray together. Amen. So if you have your tithe, can you please just stand on your feet and we'll pray together. And if you have your offering, just have it in your hand as we pray. Father, we thank you so much. 
You are such a faithful God. You are faithful to us, almighty God. You cannot ask us to be faithful if you yourself are not faithful. You have proven yourself, oh God, that you are such a faithful God. And we want to thank you so much, oh God, for your faithfulness. Here are your people, oh God, as they are tithing, Father, some of them are doing it out of a great need. They don't know how to do this and that, but they are choosing this morning to trust you. May you surprise them. As you have said in your word, you said, test me in this and see if I'll not open the floodhead, floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing which will have no room enough to contain it. Father, I pray that you may bless your children as they give this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let us come and give us a one. Tell you more, oh, in well, as you cover, 